So uh, hi, this is what I've been uh, thinking about in the best job that I've ever had. <laughs> um, and so uh, we haven't got time for subtlety uh, uh, in uh, 10 minutes. So waiting in the wings refers to the fact that deposition rates are low and that the potential of digital isn't being made uh, a use of. And so that potential, it, it can be, it has, it has a greater impact. There's the democratization of being able to uh, access that data on, uh, uh, online. It's uh, an ability to transfer into different products and update your um, collections management systems with 300,000 Flint records um, seamlessly um, if you do the, the right, uh, right things. And so, I'm just going to go quickly through content then, and what we are, where we are now with that, uh, deposition and then documentation and then give you some of my uh, wild thoughts in which you can tell me I'm so very, very wrong. Um, so why now, Chris quickly, and what Gail mentioned yesterday, so the Mendoza uh, uh, report and the DCMS response to Historic England's recommendations has relieved museums of the responsibility of curating digital um, archive. And I suppose that is an acknowledgement of the complexity of that task, and that that has to be done by a centralized specialist repository for that to be um, uh, efficient and, and, and enabled. Um, and so content, what's changed? Well, actually nothing, there you go. So um, on the next note. Uh, nothing's changed and everything has changed. So these standards, um, the AFA, the CIFA 2014 ones, and then the EAC guidance all say that the data created during an archaeological project has to be accessible and legible and stable. And so that, those standards haven't changed. The digital data still is uh, subject to those standards. And But we've got some issues that are uh, causing problems, so such as not all digital products currently um, can be archived, especially specialist data, such as digital x-rays. Um, potential analytical, but there's always been a potential for analytical data to be excluded, but that's now more apparent and uh, when, because it's, you can access the data so much easier and then you find it's not there. And, that's, um, and so it's at odds at how we expect uh, to find digital data these days. And then there's habits that have formed um, because we haven't been able to archive digital data. We haven't been able to put uh, some digital products into a physical archive. So there's habits that have been formed of not depositing uh, all digital data, all, all data, because we haven't been able to recreate it in a physical form, because it would be meaningless. And, but what's really changed as a, is the potential for access. And along with the positive uh, implications of digital data come some negative ones, and they can cover that digital content and quality is opened up to scrutiny, and that data and standards are also open up to reuse. And that can be at odds with commercial ideology. And so, and that can create um, Protection over the uh, protectionism over the data, and the, stand, uh, and the standards are used to pro uh, produce it, and then that can create a resistance to, to archive. And then the final thing that's what's changed with content is we are just creating more information. We're doing more of the same. We're taking more photos now, and then we are also doing uh, creating more di uh, techniques that are sort of like photo uh, photogrammetry and structure for motion. And so we're creating much more data and that has uh, implication for documentation. So, deposition. So we have the Algeo planning for archives and within that they used some ADS figures and their WSI figures and they found uh, that there was potentially only 2-3% to 3 of all projects undertaken in, what's 2008, so the last six years then, um, uh, undertaken in England, have been, uh, have been deposited. And that's, so that's just a really scary low figure. And then to follow up on that for deposition, you have the Society of Museum Archaeology surveys. 
So I forgot to set my timer, I've got five minutes left. Um, right, so they, those surveys, and then we had the Dig Digital survey, uh, both in 2008. They both have the magic number of 46% of museums are still saying they can take, are they still, cap uh, still saying they're capable and willing to take digital material? Um, they were, those figures then were a tiny little drop off from 2017 and a tiny little drop off from 2017 and a tiny little drop off from 2016. So maybe today I can have some more impact and knock one more percent off that. Um, and so what that potentially looks like is this. So this was a, this is the Dig Digital survey. And what they did is they asked, um, so the, they asked museums, um, could they take the data? And you got that um, 11 out of 24 responses that equals 24%. And then they also asked uh, the archaeologists what they, what they were doing. And so the total of archive, the total people who answered this question is 133. So, oh, what was it? So just under half are saying they can um, are archiving all projects. But then what you have is. Um, only then a very small number of those ones are also having created having metadata created. So metadata is the thing that you need to produce so that data can be understandable. And so there's the, our museums are um, our archaeologists are saying they are depositing data, but they're not meeting like a basic standard for understanding that data. And then poignantly, the SMA survey acknowledged that. Um, it still remains unclear that whoever provisioned those people responding understand if it's necessary, if it, understand, oh God, I can't read this. <laughs> um, I uh, understand what is necessary to expertly and sustainably curate the total digital archive. Um, and so, potentially this is represented by two things that actually then museum uh, archives when you're depositing with museums not with the ads because you have to produce better data for the ads then what's happening is is that you're not producing data or it's that the archaeologists don't understand what the word archiving means and so this is an example that was sent to me when we started worrying about what gray literature uh, uh, looks like when you're not depositing data and so this is a oasis record that is put into a grey literature report, updated onto the, um, uploaded onto the Oasis thing, anonymised it. Um, and so it's got a load of data and, um, yeah, a load of data covering lots of different topics, different types of data, and a unit are going are gonna to hold it. And so what happens when they accidentally delete that? And what they've done then to make the data accessible they started to cut and uh, to copy into the end of the report. It's quite a large report, and that all the data is put in the back. And uh, what they do then is start putting tables into the report. Um, and there is oh, I too far. there's 81 tables in that report, and then that is not accessible data. Well, it is. You can get to it, and then what are you going to do? How are you going to use that? So documentation. So what's changed with documentation? Nearly everything again and nothing again. So the ability, the, how when you describe an object, I had to just say it's an A4 sheet and it's printed or it's a pro, uh, pro forma or it's uh, handwritten. And so that's, that kind of information is replaced with tech. Um, but now with digital, there's just so much more stuff that you A, need to record and um, there's so much you need to record and there's so many more objects that you need to record. So a report, I would record at a uh, model archive description at uh, item level. I now need to describe it. It's now broken down into three items. So it's got, already I've got a lot more data just from a report because I've got the images archived separately and the tables archived separately and the text is archived separately. And then, and that goes to then just like a database where I'd, you know, would have like a pack and just hole punch it and put a piece of content through it. And then describe that I've got a pack of pro forma left to right and that's item level. I'm now describing the tech and then I'm describing what the 
the overarching database contains, and then I'm describing what each book contains, and then I just have to describe what's in each field level. And then this is um, uh, an issue that we have at the moment, because we don't have a standards for how we describe that data. So this is some data that I wanted to know what fields people were using. I got sent this metadata from the ADS, and then this is how they've, um, this is how they've uh, described it. So I want you to think about like equity of the, the records and if this is accessible. And so um, in the data, which I'm sorry I didn't include, like the fields, length, width, and diameter, I just have a number. And then here you have length of context, width of context, and diameter of context. I don't know and start until I start manipulating what the drawings have, what that measurement is. Is it in centimetres or metres? And so I don't know why I'm having a brain aneurysm over this, because this is <laughs> like, or why I'm more offended about this than they're having no metadata. Because, um, yeah, so how, are you gonna, yeah, so. That, yeah, um, so we, yeah, so we need to start having a standards for how, uh, it, we need to start saying that you have to produce metadata and you need to have starting standards for what that metadata looks like. And so I think what we have here is like assumptionalism, that's probably that all archaeologists record those things at a metre to two decimal points and then they didn't include it. But look at the le le lack of effort that they put in, they didn't sp uh, spell months all right, um, the texture of uh, soil isn't understood unless you have that diagram of how you work out what silty clay is. And so um, these are some of the problems that we have. And so, and what this means is that when uh, we're looking at reuse, it's so hard to reuse data. And so you're getting barriers to reuse of your archives and you're getting, um, and archaeologists are having, I think in a reuse survey, something of archaeologists described that they're having to make do because you're having to go to the drawing to work out what your, your measurements are and that kind of thing. And so what next? So the projects, I promised to say what projects we've been up to on funding and, uh, and what are, where places of things we've been doing leading to. So what next is we've uh, funded um, selection and the planning for archives and the work digital think archive guidance and standards and all of those. And, and then we have also the SMA uh, model wording and all of those are recommending data management plans and data management plan is a tool just so that people consider all of these implications and um, make uh, and uh, effectively plan their data because that is one of the, like the biggest barriers is like um, which I can't go into now because I've only got 10 minutes uh, to it all and so and what they will do for you is they will cover it will cover like uh, what data has been collected and what is being preserved. So it will make it open to you at the early parts of the project, if you ask for one, um, what data that, uh, to, for you to start seeing what their plans for preservation is and you to start uh, adapting or re uh, making recommendations on that. And then in the new Herald system, the new ACES system done by the Herald project, you'll be able to have the data management plan available in there. So I feel we've massively run over. Um, so here are some, so the next one other thing that the Work Digital Think Archive thing is doing is recommending that archaeologists start to um, embrace the FAIR principles at making data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And so very, very quickly, what I would say for the future is relieve yourselves of the responsibility for making the data findable and preserved and accessible online and rely on a trusted digital repository to do that for you. Then look at what, and I'm so slightly oversimplifying the uh, FAIR principles here, but look at what you need from your data to make it into what uh, you need to recommend for that data to become interoperable and reusable so you can make the most of your collections and you can make your work more efficient with that, those digital, that digital potential. And so I started, so the blue ones, light blue at the top, are uh, how we uh, how are the uh, fair principles uh, what they require to improve the quality of metadata and data um, such as defined vocabularies and that kind of thing and and then these are funds I couldn't put in the group and then these are start, starting to me starting to think about new products that we might have in the archive so I'm recommending have a data management plan and um, 
selection toolkit is uh, will be your record of what has been selected to be included in the archive. The recording manual is now the data, is my way of making shoehorning in some of the sta uh, standards and the methodology that is missing at the moment from our archaeological archives. And, um, and one thing the FAIR principles recommend is understanding the gaps in the data. And the biggest problem I have when I go to the ADS at the moment, I have all this data and I don't know what data, um, how that interacts with the physical documentary archive. And so we're, what's missing from the archive at the moment, the digital archive in particular, is a list of the, both types of documentary ar archive and how they interact with each other. That was it.